Greetings and welcome to another palm-sized LGR thing, this time focusing on the lovely little Atari portfolio. It might look like a standard digital organizer at first glance, but once you boot it up and poke around, it's apparent this thing is a legit palm-top computer. Inside is an Intel 80C88A processor running at 4.92 megahertz and 128 whole kilobytes of RAM, and it's also got a proper DOS operating system, capable of running PC software, either stored internally or on memory cards, right alongside its built-in applications. And it even acts as a quick ATM hacking tool when the mood strikes. Or at least it does in Terminator 2, if your young John Connor, with its appearance in that movie, being the portfolio's most famous claim to pop cultural fame. Easy money. Come on. In real life, though, the POFO, as it was known to its fans, was a machine released in 1989, being revealed at that year's Summer Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago. And it had a suggested price of just $3.99.95 when it hit store shelves, making it surprisingly low cost compared to the competition. Not that there was much competition, since the Atari portfolio was the only thing like it on the market for a short time, often being credited as the world's first palm-top computer. Which, eh, that's more or less true, but we'll get to that. First, though, I want to give a huge thanks to LGR viewer Brent for donating this particular POFO, along with letting me borrow a pile of add-ons, peripherals, and software for us to take a look at in this episode. Because yeah, as legendary as this miniature marvel may be among retro collectors, there are surprisingly few detailed videos about it, so I'm honored to have the chance to cover it on LGR. So, throughout the 80s, you had desktops, luggables, laptops, and finally palm tops, with a few stops in between for notepad-sized portables and such. But it was that final palm top category that so many late 80s companies were dying to crack, that futuristic idea of a PC compatible in the palm of your hand. Pocket PCs, palm tops, whatever you wanted to call them, technology pundits were convinced they were the next big thing, and sure, once they became a reality, reactions were mixed with each device clearly compromising usability for portability, but whatever, they were exciting and new. And Dip Research was one of the first companies going all in on the idea with the Dip Pocket PC. Mm, look familiar? Yeah, this was also revealed in 1989 in February at the Witch Computer Show at the Birmingham National Exhibition Center four months prior to the portfolio. And that's because Atari was simply a licensee of the design, with the initial hardware crafted by Distributed Information Processing Limited, or Dip for short. Now, they were founded in Guildford, Surrey in the UK back in 1985, providing sales and support for existing pocket computers, and began developing their own machine in 1986. And they had the skills to make it happen, due to their past work at Scion, with DIP's founder, managing director, and development director all having worked there previously. Now, Scion was behind the Scion Organizer, a pocket computer from 1984 described at the time as an electronic file effect. As impressive as it was as a handheld computer though, the Scion wasn't IBM PC compatible and didn't run DOS. The same goes for the Sharp Wizard and the Casio Boss, contemporary devices that were quote computer compatible, but only in the sense that they worked alongside a PC by transferring data between systems. They weren't PC compatibles on their own. And so, the folks at DIP made the palm top dream a reality with the Pocket PC. The plan was to license out their design to any interested parties, of which Atari was the first and only company to take them up on it. And its relatively low price made it a frequent headliner, especially compared to its most immediate competitor, the Pocket PC by Pocket Computer Corporation. It often saw direct comparisons to the portfolio in the media due to the form factor, though it wasn't the fairest fight since it had a list price of $2,000 due to its far better specs both inside and out. So, since the Pocket PC was roughly five times more costly and didn't come out until five months after the portfolio, Atari was happy to claim victory of having the first palm top ever. They even offered a full 30-day try-me-free guarantee, stating you could send it back, no questions asked, if you didn't like it. Such confidence. 
Was it merited or just marketing hype capitalizing on the novelty of its size? Well, let's power it on, dive into its capabilities, and find out. Ah, uh, the simplicity of no cooling fans or spinning disc media, just silent computing powered on by pressing any button at all. Right, so this particular portfolio we have here, model HPC 004, is one of the earlier ones with ROM version 1.056. Now, models ranged from 003 to 011, with differing ROMs and minor hardware tweaks, but externally, they're all about the same. It measures 7.5 by 4 by 1.25 inches, folded up, pretty close in size to a VHS tape, and weighs just 1 pound 3 ounces, with batteries installed. Now, on that note, it takes three standard AA batteries to do its thing, which were said to last up to 6 to 8 weeks if used sparingly. There's also an optional 6 volt AC adapter, of course, which plugs in over on the left hand side corner. Something good to keep connected when replacing those double A's since there's no other battery inside, and being that the RAM storage needs power to retain data, you'll lose all your files saved to RAM without power. Not that you've got much to lose, since there's only 128 kilobytes of memory to work with, which can be partitioned to provide either more system memory or more file storage. And of course, the operating system and bundled applications were stored in non-erasable ROM, a whopping 256 kilobytes worth. More than enough considering its stripped-down OS, known as DIPDOS 2.11, taking up only 15 kilobytes of space. And while it's functionally based on MS-DOS 2.11, it's not 100% compatible, despite being sold as an MS-DOS machine back in the day, or even IBM compatible in some cases, neither of which is entirely true. No offense to grandma's music and sound, but these ads were a bit misleading, because while it shares many of the same system commands as MS-DOS, its compatibility is a real mixed bag, with half the DOS programs I've tried barely being usable, and the other half not working at all. And you can't install a real version of MS-DOS either. The portfolio is stuck with DIP-DOS 2.11. That being said, you do get a handy handful of helpful software built into the rest of the ROM. An address book, calculator, diary, text editor, worksheet software, and a setup program. Now, they're all pretty self-explanatory and about as bare bones as you'd expect for being such tiny palm top programs, but the spiral bound 250 page instruction manual goes into plenty of detail about each application regardless. Like how the worksheet program supports Lotus 123 files, a huge deal at the time since who didn't want spreadsheets on the go? And the multifunction calculator features five distinct memory banks, just in case you need five separate instances of calculating calculation. And there's a clipboard resident in memory at all times, letting you copy and paste information from one app to the other seamlessly. Fancy stuff. Interacting with all this is accomplished using the QWERTY keyboard, consisting of 63 tiny plastic keys layered over a mushy membrane. Other than the arrow keys, the layout is pretty standard for a PC clone, with many keys performing multiple functions in conjunction with the function and Atari shortcut keys in the bottom left. And this is also how you power the portfolio off, or more accurately into a low power sleep mode. And yeah, despite the tiny keys, it's actually quite usable, though they're clearly not ideal. It really works best when held up in both hands, where you can more easily use your thumbs to smush away at each character. And you do at least get some terminal-style audible click sounds, verifying key presses. Now, this handheld position also allows you to get a better view of the LCD, which is a non-backlit monochrome panel measuring 4.5 by 1 and 5 8 inches, capable of displaying 40 columns by 8 rows of text at once, with a 240 by 64 pixel resolution. Quite low even compared to CGA, something its HD61830 video controller is not capable of running by the way, being optimized for character based software. And it does at least have some built in sound capability, with a tiny dual tone multi frequency speaker capable of outputting tones between 622 and 2489 Hz. 
conveniently falling within the same range as touch-tone telephones, so you can not only use the address book app to store phone numbers, but actually speed dial them too, by holding it up to a telephone handset. Then over on the left-hand side is a card slot, accepting credit card-sized memory cards, sometimes called B cards, providing you with some quick removable storage. These were also used in Korg and Roland effects processors and synthesizers, and typically came in three capacities. 32 kilobyte cards costing $80, 64K for $130, and 128K for 200 bucks. And each one comes with its own battery, a CR2016, so it'll retain data regardless of whether or not it's plugged into the computer. Also amusing is that memory cards show up as an A drive in the OS. There were no portfolio floppy drives available, unless you could find a third-party 3.5-inch serial floppy drive. On a related note, the portfolio also does not have built-in serial or parallel ports. But over on the right-hand side is an expansion interface, with an edge connector supporting things like serial and parallel port expansions. So yeah, if you want to connect, say, a dot matrix printer, then go right ahead. We now have what was perhaps the world's smallest word processor of 1989, not counting the printer itself. The expansion interface also allows for memory expansion add-ons, like the Memory Expander Plus adding another 256K of main memory and or RAM disk capacity. Now this is also where you gain access to the B drive, with another memory card slot around back acting as a secondary interface. Now these modules also have a pass-through connection on the opposite side, allowing for stackable expansions, similar to the PC Junior's sidecars. And this is how you can max out the portfolio with 640K of conventional memory, with two 256K modules added to the machine's built-in 128. There was also a dial-up modem expansion that was available, and even a MIDI interface, letting you output tracks to an external MIDI playback device. As for getting files on and off the machine itself, you've got a few options. One is using the aforementioned serial or parallel expansions alongside a file transfer program connected to another PC. Then there are the memory cards used in lieu of floppies, but how do you write to them outside of the portfolio? Well, Atari also sold the PC card drive interface, a somewhat confusing name since it's not compatible with the PC card standard, but it's fine since it predates that by about a year. Anyway, what you get here is an ISA card, breakout box, interface cable, and MS-DOS drivers that allow you to use portfolio memory cards on a PC. And it's incredibly simple to use, with the drivers loading on startup and the card showing up as a standard drive with its own assigned letter. You can then copy files on and off the card within DOS or Windows, just like any other removable disk drive. Sweet. The final option for loading things came by purchasing boxed software, and yeah, there were a handful of portfolio-exclusive programs released. They came on their own memory cards, this time with non-volatile memory so there's no need for coin cell batteries. And the majority of these came from Atari themselves, like PowerBasic for programming basically powerful programs, and the File Manager, offering a much appreciated shell for managing all your data along with an interactive tutorial for learning the ins and outs of using the portfolio without diving into the manual. Very useful. There was also good old chess. Perhaps the only standalone game officially sold for the platform. It's chess. It's nifty and chess-like, and it's exactly the kind of game that doesn't suck on a machine this small. Even a few third-party titles were sold for the system, like FastPay here, a payroll management program for small businesses, and this has got to be one of the rarest cards released for the platform, at least I assume since I can't imagine folks were clamoring to keep track of employee records using the portfolio's teeny little keyboard and display. Finally, there's the MS-DOS side of the equation, with the countless PC programs that theoretically might run if the portfolio's playing nicely. That is a big if, though. Actual compatibility is severely limited due to hardware differences, its bespoke version of DOS, highly limited graphics, and 128K of RAM. So if it's a DOS program that runs within those parameters and doesn't rely on directly addressing an IBM BIOS, then you might get lucky. But those are few and far between, so ideally you'll want to seek out software that's specially adapted for portfolio usage. You're not going to play Doom on here, in other words, or most any other standard IBM PC program, really, with the majority of them either running with garbage on screen, freezing up the whole system, or refusing to run at all. 
and this is with greater compatibility enabled in the setup menu, which the manual tells you to do anytime you're running standard PC software. Now, thankfully, there were hundreds of purpose-built apps programmed by the portfolio community, and yeah, the homebrew scene was highly active for a number of years, and much of it's still readily available online. Like, one of the first things any portfolio owner does is run the obvious T2 pin program, letting you indulge the fantasy of gaining easy money from an ATM to go play some arcade games at the local mall before being hunted by a weird liquid metal dude. Lots of games were developed and released for free as well, although none of them are particularly deep, but that's fine. This is a 5 megahertz system from 1989 with 128k of RAM and a 40 column screen. What do you expect? The limitations make exploring its software catalog fascinating, with all kinds of clever workarounds and technical solutions being made to pull off the best experiences possible on such deficient hardware. Like this intriguing version of Tetris, designed for tilting the machine on its side so you have more viewing area to drop pieces into place in extra tall tate mode. And naturally, card games, gambling games, puzzle, and board games are all well suited here, since they don't require much speed or memory, and are easily controlled using that lovably limited keyboard. And many of the community-made programs are novelties, showing off some aspect of the system, like this one that displays animated lips, because hey, moving pixel graphics are neat, or this one that bangs away at the internal speaker to produce halfway believable human speech. And that's about it for this trek into the Atari portfolio. And I think it's wonderful for the time it came out. The POFO's combination of small size, low price, and familiar DOS-like OS make it easy to see why it remained as popular as it did, as long as it did. It wasn't actually discontinued until 1993, the same year Atari's ST and Falcon line of computers got canned and the Jaguar console was introduced. Oh, Atari, they tried. As for Dip Limited, they actually did make a mildly improved successor of sorts, a machine sharp sold as the PC-3000 in 1991. And while Dip wanted to build a 386-based palm top as well, the company was sold to Phoenix Technologies in 1994 before that ever got off the ground. Kinda sad, considering how popular palm tops and handheld computers got throughout the 90s, most notably the HP LX series. Seriously, if you want a proper PC palm top from the time period, check out the 95LX that runs real MS-DOS 3.3. Or even better, the superb 200LX running MS-DOS 5 with a full CGA resolution display and a solid one or more megabytes of RAM. Not to mention all the other folding machines that followed, even modern handhelds and folio devices like the GPD Win Max and Microsoft Surface Duo feel as if they owe a debt to the groundwork laid by Dip Limited and the Atari portfolio. So, while it may not be the most useful thing as a standalone personal computer running DOS, the portfolio is still wildly cool in my view, and worth a respectful look back into the world of palm top computing over three decades ago. And if you enjoyed this retrospective, then do check out some of my others. I love covering tiny PCs and vintage computing silliness in general, so stick around for the stuff I've got coming up, or perhaps wander into the deep back catalog of LGR things. And as always, thank you for watching.